Do you have state funding? Oh, I mean, we're going to be a part of our city. Oh, thank you for being here tonight. Tonight, we welcome Sushila Jayapal, who has proudly served as the District 2 Multnomah County Commissioner since January of 2019. She was born in India and came to the United States when she was 16 to go to college. An Oregonian since 1994, Sushila has lived in Northeast Portland for over 25 years and is the mother of two Grant High School graduates. She's a lawyer whose last legal job was as general counsel for Adidas America. As general counsel, she was responsible for all legal and human resources functions and spearheaded work to improve conditions at the brand's partner factories worldwide. She also spent two decades as a volunteer community leader advocate for a number of different community-based organizations, including Planned Parenthood of Columbia Willamette, Oregon Community Foundation, All Hands Raised, Literary Arts, CASA, and Metropolitan Family Service. So we are excited to have her here tonight to share her story with you. And we are going to do something a little different if you've been to our other talks. We are asking at the end when you have questions, if possible, you can go to the microphone in the center aisle. That would be very helpful. And um, without further ado, we welcome Sushila. Thank you so much, Janice. It is just an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a Thursday evening for for uh, for the storytelling session. So, um, you know, I will tell you that when I opened up the event in my calendar yesterday and realized that it was going to be a personal story that I was going to share, I had many moments of panic. Um, <laughs> many moments of panic. Monique witnessed all those moments of panic. <laughs> this is Monique Smiley, a key member of my team at Multnomah County. Um, and it was because I talk to people all the time, and if you ask me questions about policy, homelessness policy, or public safety policy, or you know any of the work that we do in my office at Multnomah County, I would happily talk to you about it for hours um, in gruesome detail. And if you sign up for my newsletter, you will get that gruesome detail in writing. But the notion of actually talking about myself um, was absolutely panic-inducing. And I'll say that um, folks often assume that if you're a politician, you like talking about yourself. Well, <laughs> I am the perhaps rare politician who, who doesn't particularly. Um, I'm an introvert. I'm a private person. So there are ways in which this uh, line of work that I've chosen is, is sort of an, an odd fit for me. Um, but I really love the fact that you've decided to ask people to talk about their personal stories because, you know, uh, in office I have more and more recognized the importance of the story in terms of helping people connect with each other um, and understanding where each of us come from and building those connections. And there's also a way in which I feel like I was created by stories. I was brought up on stories. I don't know if there's anybody here who, who knows the phrase bookworm. Is that yeah. yeah, oh good, I'm, I'm with my people. <laughs> um, I was a bookworm, you know, as a kid, I was the kid who when I was supposed to be taking a nap, I was under the bed with a, mic with, with a microphone, with a book in my hands. Um, I was the kid who in school spent every free moment at the library. And the day that the librarian introduced me to a series, I'm thinking like Wizard of Oz, and there's like 14 books in the series. So, oh, that I felt like I had died and gone to heaven. So um, I really feel like much of who I am and the ways that I move in the world actually were created by stories. So again, thank you so much for um, Janice. Thank you, you know, whoever put this series together for uh, asking us to do something that for some of us feels like stepping out a little bit. Uh, but I think it's just really, really important. So, so uh, with that introduction, I am, uh, as Janice said, Sushila Jayapal. I am the Multnomah County Commissioner for North and Northeast Portland. Um, you're all in Clackamas. I'm not your commissioner, but I'll tell you what my geography is. It starts at the St. John's neighborhood in the Northwest, and then it's everything north of I-84, and it goes all the way out to 148th in, on, the, on the Northeast side. So it's the 
if you look at Multnomah County, it's the long skinny strip at the top of our long skinny county. And, um, you know, as Janice mentioned, I have been doing this since uh, 2018. I just started my second term, thank you to the voters of Multnomah County. Um, we have two four-year terms and it's really my honor to do it. So I'm going to share my story and I'm going to tell you that I'm, it's very informal. Um, I did not try to shape it. I did not try to have like a, a narrative arc. I hope there are themes that will emerge. I'm hoping you have questions because I think that we get a lot more and you'll hear more about what you're interested in with questions. Um, but I put together uh, some photographs and so I kind of thought of this as like, let's pretend you're in my living room. My living room is not this big. Um, <laughs> let, let's pretend you're in my living room and we're looking through a photo album together. And I'll just kind of walk you through some of these photos and tell you my story through those photos. If I can, of course, figure out how to make this thing work. And we'll go there. So, um, I am from India originally. I was born in India. And I was born in the southern state of Kerala, which is that little red strip that you see in the bottom of the subcontinent there. It's blown up a little bit on the right-hand side. Um, to give you a little bit of context, uh, the state of Kerala has a population of about 35 million. The language that we speak is called Malayalam, although of course there are several languages spoken in every one of the states. Um, India, and you know, I do hope I'm not repeating information that you know, India has 23 official languages recognized in its constitution, 23 distinct languages. So if you cross, if, you, if we were to show you the whole map and you cross from state to state, if you go from one state to the other, you're not going to be able to understand the language in the next door state. It's, it's a little bit like Europe. You might think of it as a confederation of states. And there are different customs, um, different traditions. You know, it's, it's really more of a confederation than it is um, sort of a co co connected whole. So, so 23 official languages, uh, hundreds of uh, other languages and dialects. And in my state, the language we speak is Malayalam. A couple of other interesting uh, sort of little factoids about Kerala. Um, it's, of course, on the coast there. It is lush. Uh, it's got an interior canal system and sometimes likes to refer to it as the Venice of India. Um, I'm not sure Venetians refer to themselves as the Kerala of Italy, but, you know, there you go. We have a canal system. It has the highest literacy rate in the country. Um, it's got a literacy rate of about 91%. Um, it is currently governed by a communist government. It is one of the very few democratically elected communist governments in the world. It has a very high female literacy rate as well. And we think this is because many of the ethnic groups in Kerala are matrilineal. And I'm from one of them. It's an ethnic group called the Nyers. Um, property passes through the women. And there are uh, stories, whether, you know, the extent to which they're apocryphal or actually true is, is a little bit uncertain. But my mother, for example, used to tell me that um, in Kerala, and for the Nyers in particular, women decided when a marriage began and women decided when a marriage ended. And putting your husband's shoes outside the front door were the signal. So <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I know anyone who's tried that, uh, but, but that is that is the story. And I, you know, I, I talk about the fact of, of this matrilineal culture because I do think it's it's a thread um, when we think about why female literacy is so high. I think the fact that women had status and property passed through women is one one of the reasons. So very lush um, coastal on the you know on, on to the west and then. Uh, green interior, uh, lots of tea and rice in the lower lying areas. Uh, it's really beautiful and we were called Malayalis. Uh, we Malayalis believe that it is God's own country. That's the phrase that you hear all the time. Um, it's also really diverse. So sitting on the coast um, and also being uh, sort of at the center of the, the various spice roots, lots of pepper, lots of other spices. You know, this is this is a, a modern day uh, photo of a spice market in one of the largest cities in Kerala. But because of that, because of the position and the spices uh, and sitting in the center of trade, it's very diverse. Um, the population in Kerala is about 50% Hindu, 30% Muslim, and 20% Christian. Um, it's got the largest Christian population in the entire country. And it is reputed to have the first uh, 
temple in the country, the first church in the country, and the first mosque in the country. And there's also still, I don't have a photo of it, but there's also still a synagogue in the capital city of Kerala, the city of Cochin, because starting at about 532 BCE, there was migration of um, Jewish community to Kerala. After the creation of Israel, that community is really dwindled, um, but it is, it's an important thing to me, and it's something that I mentioned because my children's father is Jewish, and they call themselves Hindus. And so, <laughs> and so being able to go to Cochin and have them feel a sense of connection and tradition to both of their parents has really been meaningful, I think, for all of us. So um, this, uh, so you see one of the churches, the landscape is really dotted with churches and temples and mosques. Um, this church is in the city of Palagat. It is the city where my mother's family was born. I mentioned that we're matrilineal, and I'll say that when you hear me talk, you'll hear me talk about my mother's family. My connection is to my mother's family. We don't have the same connection to my father's family, but this is where my mother's family comes from, the city of Palga. Um, sort of watery and, again, lush and coconut palms. My grandfather, uh, my great-grandfather, sorry, was a doctor, and not a lot of money, but a lot of... Uh, status, well-respected, and he built the town's uh, temple, and that temple still stands. Um, this is the interior of the temple, and my family makes a pilgrimage there every October. I have not typically been able to go because I've been here, but many, uh, my, my great-grandfather had 12 children, and so, so there's a lot of families scattered all over the world, really. Um, I was able to go for the first time in October of 2018, and this is a photo from that time. This is family members in the interior of the temple. That is my mother that you see, the white hair to the left, and then that's me in the middle. And we are moving through the temple. The interior has these walls that are lit with millions and millions of millions, maybe not millions, hundreds, let's say hundreds, of oil lamps. And um, the tradition is to circumambulate that interior, lighting the lamps as we go, and you know, thinking um, of of people that we've lost or or whatever else might might really feel grounding in that moment. This is my grandmother. Um, her name was Ramani. Uh, she was one of also eleven children. So again, lots and lots of family members. Um, she never got to go to college. She entered an arranged marriage with my grandfather when she was 19. Um, and you know, I'll talk a little bit about arranged marriages. They, they run a gamut. There can be arranged marriages where the couple has never met each other, all the way to my parents who also had an arranged marriage, but it was a situation where, um, you know, I mean, I suppose it was like the early version of Match.com or something like that. <laughs> where uh, my, my mother and my father were introduced to each other. My grandfather made it clear that it was entirely her decision. And my grandmother's was probably somewhere in the middle. Had she decided that she didn't want to marry my grandfather, no one would have forced her to, but I'm not sure that in that day and age for her, um, that it felt as if there were a lot of choices. That, that's my guess. She never talked to me about it while she was alive. Um, she didn't go to college. And that was a lifelong regret for her. But what she did was make sure that every single one of her children went to college. That is my grandmother with my mother on the left um, and her uh, two siblings down on, on the right sitting in my grandmother's lap. And that is uh, my grandparents' family. So my grandmother on the left, my grandfather on the right. My mom it was the oldest, is the oldest, and she is the tallest one that you see there sitting on the left on the sofa, and those are her um, three brothers and sisters. So my grandmother never went to college, but this is my older sister, Amy. Um, they looks really demure. Uh, I think she's gorgeous, uh, but she looks really demure, but she was one of the very first female OEGYNs in India. Um, she was born in 1918. She went to medical school in India. I, I imagine one of the few women, I'm not really sure. Um, she then went to Edinburgh and went to the Royal uh, College of Surgeons and came back and became a practicing OBGYN um, and taught until, until her death. 
And one of the uh, one of the sort of fun facts I found out quite recently was that one of her students was a woman named Shamala Gopalan, who we now know as the mother of our first Asian, first black, and first woman vice president, Kamala Harris. Wow. <laughs> so there is a photo of Kamala and her family, and her mother was one of my great aunt's um, students. So this is uh, a photo taken in Pondicherry, which was a French uh, colony. So India had mostly British, but also French, and then on the west coast in, in the state of Goa, the Portuguese as well. Um, and the, the gentleman in the foreground is Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, Nehru was one of the founders of India. He was the first prime minister of India. And the gentleman behind him to the left in the cap is my grandfather. Um, my grandfather was a complicated person, uh, lived a complicated life. Uh, he also got married at 19. He'd been in college, but his father died and he had seven siblings. And so he dropped out of college in order to take care of his siblings, and he became a police officer. Um, the British were ruling India at the time, so he was serving in the British police force, uh, which I imagine was a really complicated place to be as an Indian, policing your own people, serving the colonizing force. He never really talked to me about it, um, but you know, again, I, I imagine what it must have been like to be in that situation, but it was a stable job. Um, it was steady and steady employment. My, he and my grandmother were moved all over India um, while he was serving in the police force. And in this picture, this is Jawaharlal Nehru's first visit to Pondicherry after the French turned the colony over back to India. Um, and. Uh, my grandfather was the superintendent in that district, and he was serving on narrow security detail in this photo. And there are my grandparents with my uncle. This must have been, I would guess, in the 70s or 1970s or 1980s. And this is my mother. Um, that is her as a, I would guess, like a 10-year-old on the right, and as around a 20-year-old on the left. And this was a photo that was sent to my father when their families were talking about whether the two of them would get married. Um, she was in graduate school at the time. She was getting her master's in English. They met once, and she decided that she was gonna marry him. And my, again, my grandfather had made it really clear that if she didn't wanna marry him, that was, that was totally fine. Um, but she decided to marry him after one meeting. Um, she insisted, however, that they wait until she finished her degree. And so that was what they did. She, she got her master's and they got married um, the year after that. And then that's me. <laughs> um, and that is my parents with me and my sister. So my dad, um, as I said, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of photos as I realized I was putting this together. I don't have a lot of photos of my, my father's family. And I think, again, it's because of this really strong matrilineal line that, that runs through our community. Um, my dad was an engineer. Um, when they got married, he was working for an American company. He was working for Esso India, which was the Indian subsidiary of Exxon. And, you know, sort of a, 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 a kind of an entry level job, I would say, but again, steady income. That was sort of a theme, was the stability that came with having a job. Um, that's my mom and my sister. So, I should move that for a second here. Um, when I was about seven years old, we moved around a lot when I was a kid, all over India. And then when I was about seven years old, my dad was offered the chance to work in Indonesia. And my mother tells me that they had to look it up on a map. They did not know where it was. Um, it wasn't a time when Indians of their generation or their economic class was leaving India. It was a really risky thing to do. And they decided to move. They decided to move with their two little kids uh, to Indonesia. And they decided to do it for, I think, a number of reasons. One was there was probably a little bit more pay. Um, one was that they wanted an adventure. Um, and I feel like that's a theme through, you know, some of some of my life is is taking some risks. Um, and they, what they've said to, to me since, um, is that they also, even as young as we were, I was seven, my sister was four. 
it really, in the back of their minds, was the thought that this was a way for us to have a better life and for us to have more options. So that was the risk they took for us. So we moved to Indonesia. We were in Indonesia for two years. We were in Singapore for two years. And I know I talked to somebody who has lived in Singapore, who has lived in Singapore. I don't have any photos, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, lived in Singapore for two years and then back to Indonesia, which is where I was from eighth grade on through the end of high school. And in those places, um, I went to international schools. Um, in Singapore, they were British. And believe it or not, I had a very British sort of Cockney accent because kids pick up accents like sponges. And then I would go back to Indonesia and then this, this accent would, would surface. Um, the students were mostly uh, American, um, certainly majority white. Um, interestingly, the, the citizens of those countries weren't allowed to attend the international schools. So when I was in Singapore, there were no Singaporeans at that school. When I was in Indonesia, there were no Indonesians at the school. And we can all, I think we'd have a whole separate conversation about what that was about. Um, but, but predominantly American, American teachers, American curriculum, um, but then people, kids from all over the world, kids from Australia, a lot of kids from Australia, kids from uh, England, other European countries, a lot of children whose parents worked in the oil industry, because Indonesia is an oil producing country, and a lot of um, missionaries, a lot of children of missionary families, and their families would be living somewhere in one of the thousands of islands that comprise Indonesia, and their children would be boarding in Jakarta, which is where we were. And, can't really see me, but I am the fourth from the right. I'm wearing a sari, and this one must have been one of our annual uh, United Nations days. And here's another one of that in color. So, you know, when I think about kind of childhood traveling, moving around in India a lot, um, India itself is a really diverse place, and then going to Indonesia and Singapore and being surrounded by, by people from all over the world and again, different languages, cultures, a history of, of navigating across, um, across communities and across cultures. Um, and then um, my parents decided to send me to the US to go to college. Uh, I was 16. Um, I had not visited campuses. I'm so jealous of my children who, before they decided where they were going to go, you know, did, did the college trip and it was totally fun to do it with them. I picked from the brochures and um, this one looked pretty. So that was where I ended up. It's an old photo. This is not what the Swarthmore train station looked like when I was there. But I did land up at the Swarthmore train station, August of 1979. And my mom and I had shopped before I got there to, um, you know, for the clothes that we managed, imagined I was going to need for a Pennsylvania winter. And so imagine, if you will, 1979, Swarthmore train station, August. And I am wearing a turtleneck, a wool sweater, and corduroy pants. <laughs> um, you know, it was, <laughs> it, it, it was, um, a little bit of an omen of things to come. I, I think you can imagine as a 16-year-old landing in a completely um, foreign environment. Um, at the time, there may have been seven international students, and they called us foreign students at the time, maybe seven that's worth more, maybe a couple dozen students of color um, of, of, of uh, you know, um, other races and ethnicities. Uh, and it was about as lonely and isolating as, as you can imagine. And, and it, it wasn't just the fact, you know, I had been at international schools, so obviously had, had been in these school environments that, where I was a minority. I think the difference, when I think about it in retrospect, is that I was in a country where I was surrounded by people that looked like myself. And so now I was in an environment where that wasn't true either. And I was in an environment where there was no one else with whom I could share experiences, right? So, so for the other students, oh, you're from California, you know, we can we can talk about landmarks in California or experiences that we had growing up, and none of that was true for me at Swarthmore. And and I'll say that the other, in, again, in retrospect, um, there wasn't a lot of knowledge about other parts of the world, and so I was asked a lot of questions that now we would describe as microaggressions, but I had no language for that. So. You speak really, you speak English so well. You speak, you have no accent. Well, I do have an accent. It's an American accent, right? 
Um, what's that dot that Indian women have on their forehead? Do you all commute by elephant? I kid you not. I was asked whether we commuted by elephant. And I think what, what you know, as a 16, 17, 18 year old, what strikes me when I think about that now is that um, I had no words to describe it. I didn't really understand what I was experiencing. If you don't have language for something, it's hard to understand it. Um, and I assumed that it was my fault. There was something, I was clearly being made to feel an outsider, and I, I carried that with me. I assumed that it was my fault. But at the same time, um, this is me my senior year. <laughs> I'm still wearing a sweater and a turtleneck. Um, I did change in between. Um, you know, uh, I, I had an amazing experience there, despite all of that. I made friends who are still my friends today. I had an education that has um, led, to, led, led me to where I am and given me the choices that my parents wanted to provide to me when they made the risk. And I'll, talk, I'll also add that when they sent me, um, there was no scholarship for international students, so you didn't get any financial aid. And while it cost a lot less then than it does now, it wiped out my parents' savings. So the, the sort of the sacrifices and the risks they made were financial, and they were also emotional. Um, they were around 35, 36, 37, my mom, my dad, and then my, yeah, my mom was 36, my dad was 36. Um, I don't think it occurred to them that when they sent me here and then they sent my sister here, we were probably gonna stay, that occurred to them, but what didn't was as they got older, we weren't gonna be there with them. So, so that's the situation that we face now, and those, you know, those are the sacrifices that I think of um, when I think of my, my parents. Oh, you know, back up for a second, not really good there. So that was, that was me, senior year, grad, uh, I graduated from Swarthmore. I'm gonna kind of zip through a little bit of what comes next fairly quickly, but I, um, I uh, went to law school, I practiced law in San Francisco and then here in Portland for about 12 years. Um, I was a litigator, as, as uh, Jess mentioned, I was the general counsel at Adidas America here in Portland. Always, and, and many good things about that, some interesting work, great colleagues, um, the financial stability that, that frankly my parents had instilled in me. This is your job. You are going to go to the United States and you are going to be financially stable and you are going to be independent. It was really clear to them that they wanted their daughters to be independent. Um, but really an underlying sense of this isn't providing the meaning that I'm looking for out of my work. Uh, I did a lot of pro bono work that provided meaning. I represented people um, applying for asylum. I represented kids in the foster care system. At Adidas, I worked on labor conditions in the factories that provided meaning. But really, at the end of the day, um, you know, at some point, about 12 years into my legal career, I decided that while it was one, it was, it was great work, it was, it was not sustaining me anymore and that I couldn't figure out what came next unless I left, because the work was so demanding, um, my kids were little, I was traveling a lot, that I really had to quit in order to figure out what came next. So I did. Um, in 2000, I quit my job at Adidas. Um, that was my kids at the time. Um, I wanted to spend more time with them, and I figured I would take a year, uh, spend time with them, you know, pursue other interests, garden, read, do all kinds of other things, and then I would then go back to a full-time paid job. Um, that one year stretched to 17 years. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I found it incredibly rewarding. Um, I found it rewarding to be with my kids. Um, I, I became a better parent. I think there are wonderful parents who manage to juggle full-time work and kids. I was not one of them. I'll uh, be completely honest, I, my, I was always you know, at work, um, mentally if not physically, uh, and I started volunteering. I called it professional level volunteer work for all the organizations that Janice listed. And I, I discovered that I loved it. I loved the service that those organizations provided. I loved um, being leadership in those organizations, and it was providing the meaning that I was looking for. Um, so, you know, did that for 17 years, and then my kids were grown, they went to college, and I was ready to, to get back in the full-time paid workforce. And I thought that what I would do would be to become the executive director of a nonprofit organization. So that was 2017. Um, you know, uh, 2016, the election of that year, um, uh, for me, uh, had, had signaled deep concerns about where we were heading politically and 
particularly in terms of representation for people who looked like me and who had my experience and for folks of color. And then even more, I think, looking around um, Multnomah County, Portland and Multnomah County, and seeing a lack of representation in Portland and Multnomah County, and seeing the effect of that, which was that folks of color, particularly black folks in North and Northeast Portland, where I lived, um, immigrants and refugees, were being displaced. And we're not, even in that time, which was uh, economically a boom time for our region, we're not able to thrive. So that was what led me to run for office in, um, I ran in May of 2018 and was elected the Multnomah County Commission. Um, that is me being sworn in January of 2019 by Judge Nan Waller. So, you know, um, when, I, when I sort of reflect on all of that, uh, the themes that I draw are strong women, role models of strong women, and this is um, obviously me, that's my grandmother in the middle, that's my mother, and that is my daughter. So that is four generations of my family, um, and that was taken probably in about 1991, because Tara looks like she's about six months old. Um, so so I, I think about generations of strong women, um, I think about generations of risk taking, and by risk taking, I, I you know I don't mean I don't mean gambling in the sense of Vegas or, or anything like that, but I mean being willing to jump out um, without having a safety net. When I decided to run for for Multnomah County Commission, I could have you know I could have done any number of other things, and I remember as I announced, I was I literally had this image in my head of oh, I have just leapt off one side of a crevasse, and I got one foot there, and one foot is here, and it's really deep here, and I just don't even know how I'm going to get to the other side. And, um, you know, that's, that's what my parents did. That's what my parents did when they left India. That's what my parents did when they sent us here. And um, my mother has continued to take that risk throughout her life. So... When I was growing up, um, she initially was a school teacher. She left that, she was a, a full-time mom. She started teaching English as a volunteer. Then in her uh, 40s and 50s, she started writing. And no one asked her to write. No one said, you've got a book deal waiting for you. She just started to write. And she wrote uh, these uh, four or five books of popular history of places where she had lived. And then in her 60s and 70s, she trained to become a counselor. Um, she started seeing clients in her home in India, which was very rare. We don't really have a tradition or a sort of professionalization. Um, and she's now 82, and she still sees clients in her home. And so the model she set for me was curiosity, continued curiosity, continued drive to learn and experiment, and to dare to not be good at something. I think that's the other thing. We, we have, you know, the, there's perfectionism in all of us, and we tend to not want to do things that we don't know that we're going to be good at. And she really set this example for me of, it doesn't matter, do it. So I started playing tennis when I was 45. I'd never done sports in my life. That was not a thing growing up. Um, it felt like a huge risk, but it also felt like it might be fun. And it turns out that it's, you asked about my passions, it's actually one of my passions now. It was so incredible to think, oh, I'm complete clubs. Oh, I can actually hit a ball with a racket. Um, so that is, you know, that is what I have this enduring gratitude for, for my mom. Um, and I think that that is also, that gratitude is also that, that sense of wanting to pay it forward, um, being appreciative of what it was that my parents and my mom in particular gave me and wanting to pay that forward are really what has led me to where I am now. And that is my parents. Um, that was taken just last month. My daughter was able to go and visit with them and she took that photo. Um, and then you asked about my passions. So, you know, my passions are service, um, reading, uh, gardening, tennis, lots of other things, and my children. This is my daughter, Tara. She was married last July. At, uh, near Hood River. This is my son Josh. He was married in April of last year. I have two weddings in one year and I survived. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, and my children are my teachers. I learn from them every single day and they 
make me the best version of myself. They made me try to be the best version of myself, and I slip a lot. I am a lot not the best version of myself. One of you knows that. Um, <laughs> but when I think about what my passions are, what drives me, at the end of the day, it is actually to make a better world for these really lovely children. And that is it. I would love to answer questions. <laughs> Wow, I've stunned you all into silence. <laughs> okay. I will come and sit over here. I'm also happy to bring the microphone to folks. Any questions? I've got a simple one. What yeah. was your favorite thing about Singapore? <laughs> well, I, I, I can repeat it. The, the, question, the question was, what was my favorite thing about Singapore? The food, the food, without a doubt. So you know, for, for, uh, if, if you haven't been to Singapore, it is a melting pot. Um, it has got there. There's a Chinese community. There's Tamil community from India. There's Malay community from Malaysia. People from all over the world, and it has absolutely the best food um, I've ever had. Pepper crab. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Yeah. Did you encounter any issues when you were here in Oregon as a woman from India, which is pretty unique in Oregon, um, having to show that you can help the population or you have issues that have to be addressed that have been neglected in the past? And how did you deal with that and what did you have to do? So the question was, did I have any issues as a woman from India having to help a population that's been neglected in the past? Or, or if you felt that people who have been marginalized because they're from outside the United States and not getting their just benefits that are due them. Um, so clearly, I'll try to repeat it again. Did I experience any issues as a woman from India trying to help folks who've been marginalized who've come from other places? Um, you know, I'll start with the first part of the question. Uh, it is complicated and difficult to be a person of color in Oregon. Um, I'll start with a little story. When I, I moved here from San Francisco, so we've been living. <laughs> Willie's laughing. <I> <laughs> um, uh, when I moved here from San Francisco, and that was 1994, um, I took my daughter, who was then three years old, or no, it was Josh, it was Josh, it was my son. He was about six months old to the, to the YMCA, and we were in the dressing room, you know, I was, I was putting his, uh, taking his diaper off or something. And this little four-year-old comes running in and screeches to a stop when she sees us and yells, mommy, mommy, that baby's brown. <laughs> and her mom comes in and says, shh. And I, I took her and said, you know, that's all right, the baby, the baby is, the baby is brown. Um, but what it signaled to me was the deep discomfort with the fact of race, with the fact of color, um, the notion that we couldn't talk about it. So, so, so that, you know, that experience continues. Uh, uh, I, I, um, most recently, I was in a Whole Foods elevator, and um, there's a woman in the elevator, and I got in, and she said, she started smiling at me, and I was like, it's great. She, she said, where are you from? I said, I'm from here, I'm from Portland. And she said, no, I mean, where are you really from? And, you know, I said, I'm from here, I'm from Portland. Uh, and we originally, I, I, sometimes you get exhausted, and I gave her the answer she was looking for. I said, I'm originally from India. And I did think to myself, I'm a Multnomah County Commissioner. I have lived in Portland for 28 years. You know, I, 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 the, the assumption I could have been from somewhere else, but the assumption that because of the way I look, I was from somewhere else. So that continues. So, you know, I think those are the issues. And then in terms of my work um, representing folks of color, representing marginalized folks, I, I think there's also this, oh, you're helping your people. So no, 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 I'm helping our people. I am supporting, our, it's not even help, I'm supporting our people. <laughs> so I think as a leader of color, there is, um, there's a lot that you have to, to you yourself become marginalized in those ways, and there's, there's an assumption that you are, um, 
only focused on a particular group or a particular issue, and that's a, that's a marginalization in and of itself. So I'm not entirely sure I answered all of your question, but but those those are some of the things that I've experienced. This is an easy question. What were your degrees in? Oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> that is easy. Um, my, uh, my undergraduate degree was in economics with a minor in English literature. And what that should tell you is that I really wanted to major in English literature. <laughs> but as I mentioned, my parents had sent me here with a very specific objective, which is get a job. And so that was the economics piece of it. And then a um, uh, law degree after that. Other questions? What kind of jobs do your kids do? Are they out of college and now that they're married, do they have, just curious. Yeah, um, my daughter Tara lives here in Portland. Her day job is at Metro, the regional government. Um, and her passion job is that she's the co-owner of a yoga studio. Yeah, um, and then my son lives in San Francisco and uh, he works for a small tech company, very cliche, living in San Francisco, working for a tech company. And the way he described it to me when he began was as uh, five guys in a coffee pot. And now I believe it's something like 20 guys, five gals, and two coffee pots. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is the biggest challenge right now that Multnomah County is dealing with and may have to look toward the future, especially with the aging population, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great question. And it's I, I have a two, two different answers to the two different parts of that question. Um, so in terms of the greatest challenge we're facing right now, in a very um, kind of immediate and tangible way, it is homelessness. Uh, you know, I, I, it is absolutely homelessness. And that is a complicated, complicated problem. And I, I won't go into it. To all of that for now. Um, I think in terms of looking into the future, it's a couple of things. It, uh, again, in a very tangible way, it's actually that we are losing population, um, and that's creating workforce challenges for, for, for us. And I think in a less tangible way, to me, it is a question about who we want to be. I'm sorry. Who we want to be. Who do we want to be? Multnomah County, Portland, the metro region. Um, we have... <coughs> It, it, some of us have, I think, a sense that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, was Portland and Multnomah County's uh, heyday. Um, and I think this is this sort of remembered, um, somewhat rosy past behind and figure out who we want to be moving forward, who we want to be as a truly inclusive community where everybody thrives. And, and it looks different. Um, and it's not going to be easy for folks. So, so that's that. I think there's there is a, a bit of an existential challenge facing us in the long term. What's the hardest part of your job, and what's the most fun part of your job? <laughs> so people often ask me if, my, if, if I'm having fun, <laughs> and um, I my job is rewarding. It's challenging, it's interesting, uh, it's frustrating. Um, fun isn't often the word that comes, but, but I, I would say that the, the, the most fun part of my job is being out and meeting people. Even though I'm an introvert, you know, people think that introverts don't like people, that's not true. We like people. We just then have to go off by ourselves every now and then as well. Um, and so meeting people, actually doing stuff like this, just being out in community, especially after COVID, um, I would say is, is the book. and well, now I'm going to go on on a list of things that are actually fun. I love learning. Multnomah County and counties in general have this widespread of subject matter. We run jails, we run clinics, we have roads, we do homeless services, um, you know, we do health care. There's just this breadth of subject matter that I really enjoy learning about. So those, those are the most fun parts. What is the hardest part of my job? Um, the hardest part is acknowledging the, the real and understandable frustrations. The hardest part is balancing impatience, frustration, sometimes anger at things in our, in our community, in our world, in our country, and at the same time being able to hold 
optimism. Now, I hold that. I don't think you can do this job if you don't hold that, but it's very hard to explain to people, to say, yep, I'm angry about that, I'm frustrated about that, that's not going well, and I believe it can go better. And I think you have to have both of those things in order to be able to make change, right? One without the other isn't going to do it. That's a great question. Thank you. Shushi, I was actually wondering, um, you mentioned that your sister as well um, came to college here in the U.S. What was her experience like? Was it quite similar to yours or some of the same issues arise? I, I think you would have to ask her, so I, I, I never speak for her. <laughs> um, I, I imagine it was very similar. Yeah. And for those of you who, who don't know, I, I think you might, um, my sister is in Congress. She is uh, Congresswoman, the amazing Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal from the state of Washington. Um, sometimes folks ask, well, you know, how did both of you end up in politics? Was that something that your parents inferred? Like, we, my parents were the most apolitical people in the world. We never talked politics at the dinner table. We talked about how was school, how was the test, you know, that, that was what we talked about. Um, so I think they are quite uh, surprised. Um, they are very proud and they have, well, my, my father has dementia, but my mother has become an aficionado of American politics. She watches CNN pretty much 24 hours a day. <laughs> um, and and I, it, I think some of the themes that I talked about are, are what lead us both to be in this position. So. Thank you. As someone who gets most of my news from broadcast and the radio media, um, you, would you venture to say how good a job you think uh, the local media does on representing the county's issues? That is a great question. Um, so when I started at the county, they gave me a tour. And uh, I don't know if you've been in the county building, but we have, we have our boardroom on the ground floor. That's the big room where we have our public meetings. And just before you get in there, there's a, there's a little room. It's about the size of a nice size closet. Um, and as I was being given my tour, I was told that the Oregonian used to have a reporter who was there every day. And that reporter was actually, I'm gonna forget his first name, but he was one of the Sulzbergers, so the New York Times family, and he was here at the Oregonian, and he was the designated county reporter. Well, we don't have that anymore. Um, and I think that the diminution of local news um, and the lack of, of reporters who understand the, the sort of operation of local government is a real problem. Um, at, I, I, I have been a, a newspaper, uh, I, I still get the physical newspaper, I'm one of those people, um, because I believe that the news media, long form news media, is so important to people's understanding of their government and their society and their community. Do I think local media does a good job? I think sometimes they do. Um, I learn things, and that's why, that's why I still get the Oregonian. I, I learn things about the county from the Oregonian. So yes, I think there are instances where they do a good job. And um, I think the lack of more detailed understanding of what the county does means that it's all about the headline. And it's all about the gotcha. And we need the gotcha. Like we, the Newspapers need to hold electeds accountable. But they also need to know about good work that's being done, um, and they need to be able to get beyond the surface headline of the gotcha. I say so, Kerala. One more little factoid about Kerala: um, it, it, it loves newspapers. We have dozens of newspapers in Kerala, and you think about what's happening in Oregon. I forget what some somewhere in southern Oregon. I'm going to forget where, but the local newspaper. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a huge loss for, for a community to have its newspaper go away. So on my very long to-do list, um, you know, I have, I have sometimes thought of um, trying, to, trying to do some work on what are new models of, of media and news, newspapers. There's nonprofit models, things like that. So really important question. Yes? Can you tell us what a typical day at work is like for you? Yeah, um, I'll start by saying that there is not a typical day. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but maybe I will pick, uh, well, let's pick yesterday. Yesterday was Wednesday, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I spend a lot of my day in meetings with uh, constituents, with organizations that do work for the county. So the county does, a, we do a lot of our work through nonprofit organizations. You know, so when we're talking about homeless services, that is typically not a county employee who's doing outreach. It is someone who works for a nonprofit organization. So um, I meet with nonprofits. Um, I try to get out and visit places and projects. And so uh, yesterday, for example, I went to a welcome center um, for immigrants and refugees that is in North, Northeast Portland. I did not know this, I learned this just a couple of weeks ago, but we are getting refugees from the southern border. You know, we've read about buses going to New York and larger cities, it's not buses being sent here, um, but we're getting something like 50 refugees a week from the southern border, from all over the world, lots of countries in Africa, um, Afghanistan. So I, I went and I, I met with those folks and heard their stories. Um, so that, uh, so, you know, a lot of meetings, a lot of Zoom, <laughs> a lot of Zoom, um, but I do try to get out when I can. The board meets twice a week for public meetings, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays is typically a briefing. Um, Thursdays is uh, decision making. Um, and I meet with, with county department heads to understand specific issues. Uh, you know, recently there's been media about the Metro and Multnomah County taxes, preschool, preschool for all, and the sport housing services tax measure, and the fact that people didn't know that taxes were due and that uh, they would charge penalties. So I met with our, our finance department to, to find out why didn't people know? You know, why are we charging? So um, I, again, I'm not sure there's a typical, and then often events like this, you know, or uh, other kinds of community events, often on the weekend as well. Yeah, you alluded to the homelessness problem. I know it's huge, but uh, the housing problem for low-income uh, workers, service workers, is dire. Uh, we have to move farther out. What is? Are there any really good programs or options now to address uh, housing for low wage earners? Yeah, thanks for that. So, well, you know, the county doesn't doesn't build housing, so I am not your housing expert. Uh, my, um, but I think that uh, some of the work that the governor is doing is really promising. In other words, um, figuring out what the incentives need to look like for builders of all across the spectrum. Um, I am very focused on the very lowest, the most affordable housing for people who aren't make less than 30% of median family income. But we absolutely need housing up and down the, the line. So I think that I think the governor's plan is promising. Um, I think the attention that the governor and the legislature are paying to the question of housing is promising, and it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time. Um, I think some of the work to ease permitting requirements by cities, by Portland, for example, is promising. It needs to happen, um, and to streamline permitting processes because what I hear from builders is that really the time that it takes to get all the permits required, the costs have gone up, um, and suddenly your project's not financially feasible anymore, and you've got to start again from scratch. So the, 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 the piece that gives me hope and optimism is that there is a sense of urgency now that I did not see from our previous governor, and I think that's, that's a really good thing. It was interesting tonight when I was waiting to come here, I was listening to the news and they were saying that on the, on the news while I was waiting tonight, that the Vancouver rentals are more than the Portland rentals, which was shocking to me. And it was going on one bedroom in Portland is 12, two, but 1200, two bedroom, 1400. Vancouver is 13 and 1500, which I've never heard that. And that was like six o'clock tonight in the news. I was like, that is, that's surprising to me as yeah, well. That was on the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I, I, do, I do think that it, it's, it's obviously not, it is obviously not only a Portland problem. Um, and, and homelessness and the cost of housing are very closely intertwined. 
And those things are not only Portland problems either. They are West Coast, West Coast problems because people want to live here. There are two pieces of real estate in your district. One is the Lloyd Center area and the other is the Concordia College, both of which need to make a comeback in however we're going to envision the future. Can you update us on anything that you know that's going on with those properties? Well, Concordia was bought by the University of Oregon. Um, and they got a hundred, I'm not going to get the number right, but a, a massive donation from uh, the Bomber family, Connie Bomber from Microsoft, and they are establishing a center for child psychology at Concordia. So that's Concordia. Lloyd Center, uh, I keep asking, I keep po poking around, I am not hearing anything about Lloyd Center. And I was there just last week, Monique and I were there, um, I was there for the first time in probably a decade. Um, it, 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 is, it is sad, it's a hollow version of its old self. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I don't know why, for example, Prosper Portland doesn't come in and really make an effort to figure out what to do with it. Um, so, sorry, I wish, I wish I had more for you, but I don't. I wish you did too. <laughs> <laughs> the rake's still there. What's that? The rake is still there. Yes, it, it, it is. I, I, I didn't realize it's still there, but it is still there. Yeah, that was where my kids hung out in, you know, kind of junior yeah. high and high school, so. so yeah. Does anybody have maybe one last question, since we're almost at eight? Okay. Um, question. Just, it must have been really hard transition for, for you and your sister and your parents when, when you came to the United States. Did your parents ever think of, of coming here, or did you, how did you adjust to that? Um, they never wanted to come here. They, uh, you know, they, so as I mentioned, we you know, grew up in Indonesia and Singapore, and then after I came here to college, they actually went back to Singapore, and they were there for about 15 years before my dad retired. But it was clear to them that they wanted to go back to India. That's where their family was, that's where their <coughs> friends were, um, and we have tried very hard to get them to come here, and they have pretty adamantly refused. My, they used to come and visit us all the time, and we would go for walks in the neighborhood, and my mother would look around and go, where are all the people? Where are all the people? They are used to a life in which there's people and noise and people drop in, and you know, it, it's just a very different lifestyle. They've never wanted to come here. So um, I, I mentioned that one of the sacrifices they made was they, they are growing old without their children nearby. And, um, I think so many of us face these issues around aging parents, and uh, my sister and I are going to have to figure out how to do it from long distance. All right, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you.